Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Johnny's Juke Joint. Uh, this evening, I am welcomed. Wait, not welcomed by. I am welcoming my uh, my dear friend and longtime bandmate and incredible saxophone player, Sarah Matheson Nadeau. Sarah, are you there? Ta da! I sure am. Hello. How are you? I'm doing very well. How are you? I am well, too, also. Thank you. <laughs> What's new in your world? Oh, like so much and so little all at once. It's been that kind of year where yeah. everything has changed a lot, but also all of the days are sort of one. I'm sure a lot of people can probably relate to that. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? Um, and at least where, where we're based, they're, uh, they're saying everything is opening July 1st. Yeah, which is very exciting. And well, then the uh, we'll start booking and touring and doing all the things we used to do so much. Um, yes, I'm very yeah. excited about that. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, w I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions, uh, hopefully as awkward as awkwardly as possible, because uh, I know that's your preferred uh, delivery. And do I take that as a compliment? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> At least if being awkward is part of the plan, then if I'm awkward, I know I've succeeded. So that's kind of good, I guess. hundred percent, right? <laughs> um, okay, so you grew up in Calgary. That's right. And um, where did you go to school? Um, Not like, like, like for music school. For music school. Yeah. Uh, so I did the, uh, the Mount Royal Jazz uh, Diploma Program back when that was a thing. So I did the first two years of my undergrad there. And I mean, it's only a two year program. So once I finished that, um, then I transferred so I could complete the rest of uh, full undergraduate Bachelor of Music. Um, so I did the last two years of that at Rutgers University in uh, New Jersey. Um, so I studied with Ralph Bowen and um, for saxophone and uh, just all the other instructors there were phenomenal as well. Um, and then, so yeah, that was my undergrad that was in jazz performance on saxophone. Um, and yeah, then for uh, graduate work, I did it at the University of Sheffield. So I would go out there um, for for anyone, where, I guess for that? all of you that, out on Facebook. Sheffield is, uh, it is very British. Um, it's about two and a bit hours north of London by train. Uh, mm -hmm. It's where Sean Bean is from. So everybody sounds like Eddard Stark and it's very cool. Um, so it's, yeah, kind of mid-north-ish. Oh God, yeah, that would be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they all just have his lovely, like rich accent. But uh, yeah, so I did, um, that's where I did my, my master's. So I would go out there in the summer for a bit and then do distance work here so I could continue um, performing in not completely uprooting uh, my life. And so that was uh, music psychology. So I studied um, kind of music and impact on our perceptions in mostly multimedia, like video games in a film context and so on. So um, kind of informed what I'm teaching and working on now, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and so to lead straight to that, you are teaching uh, at Mount Royal University and you teach, uh, the classes you teach, are they open to anybody to attend or, or are they students that are in certain programs only? Um, mostly open to everyone. The, um, the general education courses. So I teach in the general education department and in the film studies department. And, um, uh, my film studies classes are just open to anyone who has, I guess the prerequisite. There's one of them has one, one, the other. That doesn't matter. Um, then the general education ones, I think you have to be in some kind of degree or diploma program. So I think they open up to people just in like general open studies or whatever, right before the class. So the short answer is, yeah, mostly they're open to everybody. Um, so I do teach uh, an introduction to film studies. I'm going to be teaching one about film genres in the fall. And we I do kind of sneak maybe more film music into it than would ordinarily be into it because that's my favorite. And, um, but my general education course is under the umbrella of the values, beliefs, and identities cluster. So my particular class is focused on, um, on aesthetics. And um, so various instructors teach different um, kind of topics within that. So some will be on like architecture in sacred versus secular settings. And some are about, I don't know, like uh, themes of suffering in classic literature. Um, and then mine is about music and storytelling. So 
uh, mostly in a multimedia setting. We do a lot of music and film, but we also look at um, opera and then also emotion in music and whether um, structural elements of music are responsible for communicating emotion or whether it's kind of something we learn from just associating certain types of music with certain emotions and so on. So, hmm. yeah, so that's that's what I do in addition to um, performing with everyone. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. Um, OK, so you were you were a, a jazz musician and you were studying in New York and you studied with Ralph Bowen. Uh, what was that like? What uh, what did you learn from Ralph and what are the tell me three things that you took away from your time there that other musicians um, or or uh, or aspiring musicians or hobbyist musicians should know? Oh, interesting. That is a very, very good question. <laughs> Um, oh my goodness, so much. He's, Shucks, he's thank such you. a oh, <laughs> great job. A plus for you. Um, uh, he's like, he's such a wonderful instructor and he's such a phenomenal musician. So, I mean, mm -hmm. first off, for anyone listening who has any interest in hearing saxophone being played really, really well, um, I would suggest checking out Ralph Bowen. He's phenomenal. And I think, I think one thing that like, I saw my, for, for my first thing, um, I think one thing that really stood out was just how, like he's been doing this for ages. He's one of the best saxophone players alive and he's still so fascinated by it. Like he would still in the middle of a lesson kind of be like, oh, I never thought of this this way. Like just a moment, I need to go over and work this thing out. And he'd kind of sit at the drums and do something. And then he'd play something and be like, oh, this is something I could explore. So like every now and then he would just suddenly get fascinated with what he was doing. And I don't think he's like he didn't seem bored of it. And I think that's amazing, especially when people get into um, teaching what they're doing. Cause a lot of people like the whole thing where they're like, oh, if you can't do teach, I was like, okay, no, that's not a thing. Like that should never teaching be a is, thing. No, teaching I hate it when people should be say some of that. the best doers who are also great teachers. Yeah. You know, and they should, level. yeah. And like find yeah. joy in teaching it as well. So I just, I really love that he was constantly still interested in discovering things and he wasn't just like, Okay, it's week two, so we're doing these scales, and now we're doing this exercise. Like he was always so number approaching one, it differently. It's keep keep yourself interested and always be awe inspired. Yeah. Okay, that's that's great. Okay, what's what's the second thing? Um, there was one thing that, and so I guess so that's more of just a like approach to music and studying in general. I mean, so anything, I guess I'll go to the right? other end here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Which yeah. is great. I think that's uh, studying arts, especially. I think I don't know has a lot of uh, there's a lot of context and how it just impacts your life and so on. So I guess for the next one, I'll choose a more I don't know, not totally theory based, but a slightly more approach to actually playing that I always remembered um, because my lessons were at I think eleven to twelve. So he told me at the beginning, he's like, I really like to make analogies, and this lesson is right before lunchtime, so they're mostly going to be food based. <laughs> so I was like, okay, <laughs> and so he was talking about how. Um, like approaching chord changes and and so on um, was sort of like attending a really big dinner party. And he spent a lot more time describing the food at this pretend dinner party than <laughs> necessary. <laughs> um, but uh, so you could kind of always tell when he's getting hungry. Um, but he was talking about how so um, so when you're playing and uh, you're going to be improvising over a certain chord, um, it's yeah, it's like a, a party. If you arrive too early at that chord, it can be really sort of uncomfortable unless you bring something really good to that party. So if you arrive too early, people are still in their house coats and they're like, we're not ready. We don't have the balloons up. What are you doing here? And if you're playing these notes, it can kind of sound like it doesn't quite make sense. Um, but if you arrive a little bit late at the party, then you've kind of created that tension for slightly longer. And then when you like really meet that chord that the release is like even better so <laughs> i don't i'm not explaining this nearly as as well as he did but he just had this idea where you're like oh if you take a little bit longer to maybe get to the chord as long as you're doing it i don't know in a nice artistic way and picking the right notes i guess um that that was always kind of more exciting to maybe just build that tension for a little longer and then arrive at the party and everyone's excited to see you rather than getting there too early and people maybe aren't ready for it but obviously there's so exceptions two to that so is be more like gandalf <laughs> and arrive precisely when you mean to is this yes okay <laughs> number three precisely when you mean to and that sometimes it can be cool to maybe stretch that resolution a little bit longer and, and arrive yeah. a little late <laughs> you know it's interesting you say that though too because one of the things um that 
we talk that I, that I talked a lot about with students of mine is 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 um, learning phrasing from vocalists and when I'm working with vocal students too just talking about phrasing and and not being so now obviously know where the beat is and know where the phrase the natural phrase is but not necessarily be concerned like if you hear something artistically that allows you to 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 arrive just in interpretation of the melody late um, to to explore that and one of the exercises I would have them do would be like um, add a beat instead of fly me to the moon you know just come in one beat like one fly me to the moon yeah let me gaze you know and have that kind of um j just just as as experience so it's it's um taking that a step further and when you're creating your own melodies allowing them to to not be rigid am i saying that proper yeah no absolutely i think okay. so <laughs> that's cool um, so that's number two. And uh, what's number three? So, okay. Number three, I guess this falls kind of in the middle of just an interesting, like conceptual approach to sort of art and keeping your interest in it in life. And then also like making these sort of analogies. So, I mean, that always worked really well for me because I, my whole, I think my entire thought process is an analogy. I need to <laughs> take a concept and turn it into something else entirely, figure that out and then like bring it back. Yeah. Um, but uh, there was one time where, where I just, um, I'm sure people have noticed this because I'm terrible at covering it and I am a pretty open book. Um, I get major anxiety performing a lot of the time and I just panic and things that I can do when I'm just sitting at, at home and practicing uh, in this space, actually, there's a saxophone on the wall, so hopefully that helps. Um, that it works here and often it doesn't um, it doesn't necessarily translate to when I'm in a situation where I'm really, really nervous. And so something that he sort of started me on that I've kind of been thinking about a lot lately and coming up with some ideas that I, I, I would hope that, I mean, hopefully it will be helping me, but I mean, ideally it would help other people too, um, was that at one point he was like, okay, well, when you stand up to take a solo and you get all of a sudden nerves, just like block everything, um, like practice it standing up like practice it getting nervous like don't like i'm not gonna say okay go make yourself really miserable and anxious but i mean kind of because if you were in like it's almost like a dress rehearsal so if you were in a performance of peter pan where famously the person playing peter pan is hooked up to a whole lot of wires and they are being like flown all over the stage or whatever and now we're getting into my weird analogy this is my thing yeah, yeah. you would never go into the opening night having not done your part on the wires so if you've like said you've memorized all your lines and you've you know all the songs and you know all the lines and whatever but you've never done it while you're hooked up on a wire to the ceiling like that's ridiculous mm -hmm. so to this point i've kind of thought well maybe even just because he had suggested standing up and then we kind of took that to the next step for um, physical practicing where we was like, okay, you know what, we're doing rhythm changes, uh, face this wall for the A section, face this wall for the next A section, face this wall for the B section, which in a concert would be a little weird if I was just like, I've played this many bars, and now I have to face this direction. Um, but it kind of made me think that even the act of standing up for a solo, like, playing the melody, sitting down and then standing up and playing a solo and then sitting back down. Um, so I mean, I've kind of thrown it around in my mind being like, maybe I should get dressed up. Maybe I should put my suit on. Maybe I should put my shoes on. Maybe I should like full on do that in my room and like get into, um, I don't know, maybe even run up and down the stairs a couple of times. So I'm slightly out of breath. Right. Yeah. Because like, if that's kind of what we said at the beginning, if your plan is to be nervous, then when you are nervous, you're ready for it. So this has been something I'm sort of just like throwing around being like, okay, maybe if I practice being nervous, like this brings help. up a lot. So, I mean, there's there's the uh, the old joke, uh, the old jazz musician's joke, which is, how did Stan Getz play so well drunk? It was easy. He practiced drunk. So that was, yeah. the, you know, that old um, that old joke, um, which I which I, I don't know if it's true or not. Um, but uh, it, it I, I know my trumpet maker talks talked to me a lot about visualization. And they're things that we don't talk about when we're in a quantified musical experience. So basically, we're in a music degree and what we're doing, they have to grade. So it has to be quantifiable. So things like style and nuance and 
um, and and visualization and performance techniques and stuff don't come up as much. It's just you, you you're supposed to perform and most of us as musicians are introverted and you're supposed to perform and you're a young person and you've got all those other things going on that young people have in your head because you're just a normal person and now you're supposed to stand up in front of a group of people and be like this is how it goes and that's um you know it's, it's you're just expected and of course and, and a professor will just stare at you and go why 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 did you stop blowing with lots of air you know why are you doing that why are you looking down why are you playing so small why are you being so timid like it, it stop it just stop it and it's not you know so there's there's got to be we have to learn how to do that and visualization of course is is a is a great trick um pat bellabo used to talk about he would stand in his room at home with his eyes closed deep listening music um you know and one of his favorite you know saxophone solos or something or on any instrument because he, he really likes Bobby Shue and I remember I think he was even talking about Bobby Shue and he knew some of Bobby Shue's solo so well and he was um, he as a saxophone player he was visualizing he was playing trumpet in front of a in, in a concert hall in front of a, a ton of people and killing it like you know with the sounds of Bobby Shue in his head and he, he used to talk about things like that for visualization and for and and he's having fun you know he's He's just love it. <laughs> I'm writing this down. This is yeah. a very good idea. <laughs> yeah, like, this is, this is so fun. And I mean, I've I've done that. I've I've listened to piano players, and I don't have the time to to learn the skill set. And mm -hmm. and then I've you know I'm I'm like man, I would love to be able to play something like that at a yeah. in a concert, you know. Um, but yeah, okay. Well, those are all really good. I like that. Okay, who who's your I I I know the answer to a lot of these things questions, of course. But who who is your favorite saxophone player? I know I keep every time I answer these, I'm like, Johnny knows all this. And then I remember there's everyone out here on the internet listening. Um, my favorite saxophone player is Dexter Gordon, which yeah. I'm guessing that was your guess also. Uh, yeah, 100%. He's and, uh, and you've got his album right back there. Uh, I oh, do. Yeah. Good call. You can just see the G. Yeah. The but I know that album well. That is yes. that is great. And you've, it looks like you've got John Coltrane's Love Supreme. I do. Just peaking, just barely there. And, and what's the other I know one they were all it, they were sort of spread out but then there was some moisture coming in from the windows and it started to work one of them I freaked out uh the other one is sort of a one of these things is not like the other the other is Mastodon's Crack the Sky it's kind okay. of like a prog rock metal uh one but I prog rock love metal very deeply um yeah. I don't, like the guitar player went to music school he studied a lot of classical guitar stuff so there's a lot yeah. of very interesting things going on in there but those awesome. are three of my favorite albums in existence so <laughs> Do you, well, do you remember when we did, because um, I think Brian brought it up last week when we, when the CJO, when we did uh, Winton's arrangement of Coltrane's Love Supreme. I do remember. And I think that was very, I can't remember how many years ago, but it was a couple days ago that my Instagram stories was reminding me. And it was like, look at all these saxophones. And I was looking going, what did I play soprano for again? And there's that one like eight bar thing in that Love Supreme arrangement where it's five sopranos. Five sopranos. That's a lot lot of sopranos yeah that's four but yeah and a half more I, that than was very need. fun yeah, yes <laughs> <laughs> half a soprano <laughs> i kid so uh that was so amazing. fun it didn't hurt my back to play at all like what a good time <laughs> yeah don't get used to that um <laughs> and well let's just go around your room there so i see it looks like you've got a painting of the beatles above. i do i didn't realize my backdrop was such a like collage of my favorite it's music. a collage and you've got a, a saxophone I do. And, and I'm loving this, that, that style of, of kind of metal art piece and thing that you see, especially you see it a lot with music. My, my grandpa, my grandfather had a rumpus room and uh, he used to call it and it had black and white tiled floors. And that was where all the parties would be. And uh, in, in his basement, just in a post-war bungalow, but the, you know, the majority of the basement was this, this room that he called the rumpus room. And he had a record player at one end with 78s and, and, um, and records I, I still have all the records and all over the walls he had uh big band pictures black and white big band pictures and artists and 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 stuff all around the walls and and stuff like that um, oh i love that that's wonderful it was, it was really cool it was a neat it's a it's a neat so yeah, anyway you're, it's it's reminding me of that um oh, i very much wish i had black and white tile but unfortunately i have a whole bunch of mess of like baby stuff <laughs> in here yeah. for a while which isn't yours it, it's actually your baby no. yeah yeah <laughs> to be fair i 
I have a few toys that I'm like, why do I have this Finding Nemo toy when Finding Nemo came out when I was an adult? And it's great because now I can give it to my baby to play with. But I'm like, no, I <laughs> buy toys as an adult. So. I've, I've known you. That doesn't surprise. But I mean, I have this little bear that I bought at the Blue Note in New York because they had a bear and I wanted to have it. And now I'm like, maybe I should share my Blue Note bear with my baby. But also, it's my, my Blue Note bear. Oh, <gasps> yay, Blue Note toys. My Blue Note pen. <laughs> It doesn't play very well. Obviously, but, um, Blue Note is killing it with the merch. This is really good. They it's are CTL killing bears. it with the merch. I think I, I bought, like, I even bought, I bought t-shirts. I bought, I, you know, just support the club. Yeah, I saw absolutely. Chris Bodie there right yeah. before the uh, the lockdowns. And Veronica oh, Swift yeah. was singing and she was amazing. Um, okay. And then you've got some girly flower stuff, which that is, is very you. That is my bouquet from my wedding and my sister's bouquet from her wedding next to it or oh. my bouquet from my sister's my maid of honor one that's what that makes called. more sense i'm like why yeah, would you have uh -huh. your sister's bridal bouquet does she know yeah i was she like wait know. a minute no and it's so much smaller no it was my bouquet from being her maid of honor so i remembered to actually hang them upside down so those are those are more than just like regular flowers i guess they're kind of right. special and most importantly we have a we have a stormtrooper very important it means business when i'm yeah. teaching my classes i'm like this guy my backup. I'm looking. I'm looking back and seeing that, and I'm looking up and seeing in right there, I, my that trumpet of mine kind of looks like it should be played by a stormtrooper. Oh, it kind of does. Yeah. You should have a stormtrooper helmet helmet next to it. Have the trumpet like <laughs> just mount it on the wall. Cut that. Oh, cut the helmet in half. Have the trumpet the coming out. <gasps> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Um. Okay, so you also, uh, obviously, we talked about other instruments playing other woodwinds, which is very expected for uh, big bands and jazz orchestras, and, and especially with the Calgary Jazz Orchestra, uh, especially um, with some of my writing. I like to, to really throw you guys around in different instruments. Um, so you play um, the bass clarinet as well, a lot, right? I write a lot of bass clarinet for you. And, and I think it's going to get better. And this is... This is another thing that I feel like just pertains to life is if you are super mega struggling with something a lot, maybe look into some external factors just in case and don't just keep expecting that life is going to be impossible. Because I lent my, like, actually just a bit before the pandemic, I think I lent my bass clarinet to um, Jim Brennan, who's another one of my former teachers and saxophone players who's amazing. And he, yeah, he needed to use it. And he just messaged me and was like, you know, this doesn't work right <laughs> i was like what and he's like it is almost impossible you can't get over the break like this key doesn't work or whatever and i was like oh i thought i thought bass clarinet was just like the hardest thing in the universe <laughs> so he was like no it's important to look into why things are hard maybe ask for help maybe don't always assume that it's you <laughs> so um valuable life lesson and also um probably gonna be a little happier to see bass clarinet parts now because apparently it wasn't entirely my fault which is okay. great news. Because you know I love writing for bass clarinet. <laughs> yes. And oh. I love the sound of it. And it's beautiful. And now it actually works, which is like a whole very exciting thing. <laughs> okay, good. Well, um, maybe you should have done, you should have lent it to him a few years ago, I guess. Um, yeah, seriously. The, uh, I just assumed it was me the whole time, which is like not a good way to go about life. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, okay. So when it comes to playing Barry sax, give us three tips in two minutes to make someone a great baritone saxophone player? Ooh, three tips and two minutes. Oh God, now this is like, this is really intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, like, and I, I don't have much to compare this to because I obviously only have like my experience and my familiarity with, with instruments, but um, I kind of feel like flute helped. <laughs> Really? Um, so for because anyone who don't know, it requires know, I, so much air blowing over the hole. Yeah, because hmm. some people who I know would, um, would go to Barry and be like, "Oh, this is a lot of air," and I was just like, "Oh, is it?" <laughs> um, so I was a flute player before saxophone player, um, not like at a university level, but in in high school and in um, jazz band. And then they were like, "Sorry, we don't have flute." And my dad said, "Well, I played saxophone, so you should play saxophone." And I was like, "Okay, I'll play saxophone." And then I really liked it, so it worked out. Um, but yeah, like I, 
I don't know, it never felt like it needed as much air as Fluke did. <laughs> um, so I don't know, maybe it's one of those things like when you get really far in some some sports, um, they have you do ballet because that technique actually ends up really informing your playing, which I guess kind of parallels studying a lot of classical technique can often help with jazz as well, just because it, I don't know, strengthens different muscles and areas of your brain and stuff. So, um, I mean, maybe I'm just thinking of that because we're talking about, um, talking about doubles before, but I don't know. Um, getting a harness is really good. So it doesn't squish your back too much. I don't know. So a lot of air, of, get a harness. Yeah. Get a harness. And, and I mean, listen to really good berry players. Like, I mean, yeah. and listen to like, I think one of my very favorite things about berry is that it's sort of a lot of instruments. Like, I mean, this happens a lot in rehearsals where you'll be like, okay, saxophones play. And I'm like, okay, but is that me? Because I don't play that, that line. So I guess not. And you'll be like, okay, trombones now play this line. And I'm like, okay, I should, I'm a trombone right now. So I should probably do that. So, I mean, kind of listening to other instruments and other parts, I feel like has, has helped me a lot too, because I don't know, as a low instrument, you're sort of really, actually as any range instrument, you're really conscious of what your role is in the, in an ensemble and like, layers and kind of what function you're serving I guess so yeah I don't know like listen to other berry players sounds really basic but I don't know there's so many different sounds that people get out of the instrument that it's I don't know I think it's awesome spoilers I like berry sax okay so <laughs> speaking of great berry sax players I'm going to play something for you now hey. and I want you to tell me who the baritone saxophone player is. <laughs> no no I'm scared Just drop the needle <laughs> No, I haven't done this in forever. I'm gonna keep Do you know this recording? It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I'll give you a hint. He played with the Duke Ellington Orchestra for a long time. Well, like, I feel like I should know if it's Harry Carter, though, but I don't know. It's not. No, it's not <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I was like. It doesn't sound like him, really. Yeah, I don't it doesn't know. sound like him. Then he, I mean, then he played with um, Jazz and Lincoln Center. Is it Joe Temperley? It's Joe Temperley. Okay. <laughs> That was kind of what I thought at first when I was like, oh my god, like... <sighs> he's he's one of my favorites. That's why I was like, it doesn't sound like Harry Carney, and then you said Duke Ellington, and I was like, oh no, if it's Harry Carney and I didn't recognize it like immediately, <laughs> then like I have to turn in my Barry card or something. But I mean, when you started, I was like, it's probably Joe Temperley, but I yeah. just... Well, I, I, <sighs> I, I, I actually had someone come up to me, you might find this uh, funny, and it was... It was, I can't remember where we were playing. It was somewhere n not um, metro, metro, metropolitan. Like it was a small town somewhere. And the person came up to me and he said, um, when you sang that song, I don't, I don't even remember which song it was. When you sang that song, and, and I found it quite a compliment because I knew what they were saying, but they said, you sounded a lot like Harry Carney Jr. And I went, <laughs> 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 okay. That's amazing. I'll I mean, that. if you combine the two, that'd be pretty good. So... I, I mean, I'm glad they knew the name Harry Carney. So, yes, and, I would and actually Connie, just be excited Jr. about so, that. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's Sunset and the Mockingbird. That's um, the Ellington. Um, th that's their live in Cuba recording. But I love that track. And um, yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll do it when we do Ellington again. We'll do yeah. it and and feature. Love to do Ellington again. And we'll feature. Um, uh, the someone playing, playing, yeah, you, uh, uh, the stormtrooper. Um, That's what you're playing. pointing at, I assume. Hopefully, hopefully, when the stormtrooper plays Barry, uh, it can actually hit its targets more often. Than... 
very good. <laughs> okay, so something you and I have talked about before, and I think this is an important thing to mention, is uh, um, gender in music. So what are the challenges, um, you know, specifically when we say gender in music, we're talking about women in music and women in jazz. And, um, and I know for, for me as, as like, I, you know, I just don't, th like, I don't think about those things. I'm thinking about the music and I'm thinking about how everyone's playing and I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, the audience and are we putting on a good show and is the music mm -hmm. together and, and are the charts written well and how can I improve and how, how can we improve? And those are my thoughts. Um, but I know that when we've toured and when we've gone and done like the school tours and it is the coolest thing ever when I see a, a young girl loving the fact that there's there's this great woman in the band who's, you know, playing and tearing it up and seeing that. So I recognize the importance of 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 championing that right so that so that we can inspire more more especially when we do school tours but when we inspire so we can inspire more kids to to greatness and and have them more to to belief in themselves but um what are what are some of the challenges that you've come across um that are that are you know in the music industry that are gender related and and uh and possibly uh, you know benefits or hopeful things or good things that you've experienced out of it yeah it's it's bizarre like it's because it simultaneously feels like a really big thing sometimes but it i wish it wasn't <laughs> like, like yeah i mean as you said when you're like it's not something you think of which i mean ideally in a perfect world that would be the case like nobody would care obviously the things that that separate people on those levels have nothing to do with how you play your instrument um right. unless you're doing it wrong but um <laughs> like it really shouldn't it shouldn't matter but that's not the the world that we live in um so i mean it it kind of does and so a lot of people are like they don't have to think about it so it doesn't make that much of a difference but it, like i mean I do notice that when I think of all my favorite musicians, when I think of this is a huge theme in just life, a lot of my favorite like movie characters, a lot of my favorite everything's like it's usually guys. All of the artists behind me on these records are male. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. that's not that's not why they're good or anything, no. but, but it's just sort of the unfortunate reality. So um I, I read about this a little in my, in my undergrad, I didn't, or in my graduate work, I didn't do specific research on it, but I remember reading a couple of articles because I was thinking about writing a paper on it, but it ended up turning into something else. Um, but just some of the ideas as to, um, like why that is, because, so I've also had people come up to me after and be like, Oh, it's really cool. You're a girl in the band. And I'm like, okay. Like yeah. me. But then they're like, why are, <laughs> are you the only one? And I was like, okay, well, that's a whole thing well, well, okay, so okay been... so i've actually had someone come up to me and say good for you for having a woman in the band you know specifically oh yeah well done you, you. <laughs> like well done you i'm like well done i didn't do anything <laughs> you know she did her homework she earns you her chair the credit <laughs> isn't that ridiculous yeah yeah like like no but she, that's she, how some I people didn't, see it i didn't sit at home and practice saxophone and study with Ralph Bowen on saxophone and, and, and dedicate myself to performing baritone side. Like it's the weirdest thing that I, I, and I didn't know how to respond to that because they meant it. It was, a you know, they meant it oh, to be uplifting. Um, and it was a lady coming from a lady. Um, and she meant it completely uplifting, but I just, I, I, I you know, I took pause for a second. I'm like, it has nothing to do with me. Yeah. And I know what you mean. I think that's always coming from a good place where they're more coming up and saying, well, thank you for not completely excluding women. I think that's really what <laughs> that has happened. Yeah, so like, thank right. you for not being a monster. And you're like, thank you oh, for not welcome. being a chauvinist monster. Um... Yeah. You're like anytime. <laughs> oh, God. So, and I absolutely like, I, I fully get that too, but yeah, like it, it's really weird. So when I was looking into this, because when people asked why I was like, I don't know. Cause yeah, again, it's not like you were like, well, there can be only one. <laughs> there can be, it's very much like and Highlander. Like, 
It is. It's almost exactly. Yeah. Obviously, there have been any time we've ever hired another another uh, woman in the band. You've you've. Uh, I've had to fight her. Fought her and and beheaded them. Yep. That's it. Yeah, I'm just like no. This is While singing not. Uh, Queen, what's the song? The one, the one from the show, the the Queen song from the show. I just forgot it. Queen song from the show. Yeah, that ruins the joke. I forgot the song. I know. We'll edit. Some... We'll fix it in post. We'll we'll yeah. edit it in where we're suddenly <laughs> like the lighting's different because it's nighttime and we get the right answer and put in like some laugh tracks too because we yeah, nailed perfect. the joke. Uh, good thing this is just a rehearsal. <laughs> okay, so you're saying like you you some of the things you've so why why are you the only one? Oh and, yeah, and so... is that partly because because see when I look historically, I, I had someone talk to me once about how there were no oh now there's all these great female comedians and there never used to be, and I'm like Carol Burnett is still brilliant if you watch her stuff, and I remember being a kid and and seeing reruns of her shows thinking. Uh, oh my goodness, this woman is is hilarious. Like I was a yeah. child and I realized her intellect and her humor and her skill at delivery and timing and face manipulation, all the things she could do to make you feel warm. And I'm like, yeah. she was brilliant. And when I think of some of my favorite um, jazz musicians and, and even some that I, that I study, their phrasing and some that I, I have my students study, like Shirley Horn is like top of the list for, for phrasing. Now that's just my preference, but... Um, but is it because there haven't been historically enough because there was a lot of chauvinism and there's, so there haven't been enough role models to open up to young women going, Hey, I, I can empathize or I can relate. I can, is that part of it or. I mean, obviously I can only speak to my experience, but like, I I think that's gotta be part of it. Like, I think there is a lot to be said for, I mean, all of your favorite things um, being made by people who, I don't know, look different than you. (laughs) Like, like you don't necessarily see yourself in that. Um, I mean, that being said, like, you like with music, you're like hearing it and you're like, okay, I want to play music like that. You're not just like necessarily looking at the musician being like, I want to be that human, but it's still like, there's, it's still really tied to that. So I've read kind of a number of things on it and I don't really know which I think is the most plausible or I think if maybe it's a mix, but that was a lot of it is that, yeah, now um, obviously you don't have a rule that we can only have one and like, thank you for allowing one like, woman into your band. How nice of you. Like, obviously that's not a rule, but a long time ago, probably was (laughs) like and um so but there's also even if it wasn't a specific rule I mean and women weren't allowed to do a lot of things for a long time but um even if it wasn't a rule there was still just a smaller pool to pick from which I guess has still sort of been the case but um so what I'd seen a little bit was that um there was some interesting studies looking at why if you look at like high school and junior high jazz bands I'm sure you're familiar with and do a lot of clinics. It's a pretty even split. There's a lot of girls in them. There are and every now. time you go and do clinics now. at high schools, there's a yes, but like in the last like 10 years, every time you go and do clinics at high schools, there's usually a lot of girls and they're playing saxophone, they're playing trombone, they're playing whatever. Like they're playing so maybe, all the things. Maybe this and is then all of a sudden you look at university. Be, maybe this is something that we just are going to naturally grow out of. Because we've seen I mean, a lot of movement forward and we see the necessity for it. So that, mm-hmm. um, and, but there was a, there was a thing where Wynton Marsalis was talking about um, race. And he mm-hmm. said, you know, if you're a clarinet player and you're standing on the banks of the, I'm going to, you know, probably not remember the story exactly, but if you're a clarinet player and you're standing on the banks of the Mississippi and you see a riverboat go by and we're going back, we're talking about early jazz kind of times. And uh, so let's say it's 1922 and you are in New Orleans. And so, and you hear a riverboat going by and you hear coming across the water, you hear the sweetest, swinginest, most beautiful clarinet lines and tone and sound you've ever heard in your life. And you're a clarinet player. All you know is I I want to aspire to be, that's, that's in my passion, that's in my soul. I want to do everything in my life to dedicate my life to trying to do what that person is doing. And, and it, it's a, you know, 
the color of the person is irrelevant at mm-hmm. that point. And he talks about music being a big bridge maker for that. And uh, I mean, hopefully we're in the we're in a forward momentum with that then. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, is there anything that, that that can be done from your perspective that you think that we can that, that, that we as the music community can do to to um, facilitate that? Um, I'm not sure about the music community, but I think a lot of the things that I, I saw being presented as, as theories as to why there's this sudden drop off after high school where you have a, like currently you have a lot more women and girls and jazz band and then you get into a post-secondary setting and you don't. Um, the theories were partially that jazz can be like a slightly more unpredictable career path and that's a little bit harder. <laughs> like you don't necessarily have, you don't get it's a the mat biggest leave understatement of tonight's yeah, chat. That's a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The last year has showed us, <laughs> Yeah, but it's not one that if you're planning on starting a family, like I didn't really know um, a lot of people when I was like, I mean, yeah, for those of you who don't know, I had a little, had a little baby last year um, and I didn't really know a ton of people who had gone through this in this particular industry, in this particular like genre performance too, that had had, had a baby, like had it come out of them. I knew lots of people who had had a baby but they were like I had a baby it's very sweet and now I'm here at rehearsal a little while later and like my body is fine and I can lift my instrument and I'm not falling apart so that makes it tricky and then also I think over the years and again like in the past um women have been taught to be like maybe a lot less assertive and we're now kind of getting past that and being like we don't have to apologize for everything we don't have to whatever and jazz is a little tricky with that too because you have to stand up and you have to take charge of taking a solo and you have to be like, yeah, you should be looking at me and I shouldn't be apologizing for anything. And like, so I've seen interesting things looking at the psychology of it. And like, as soon as improvisation becomes the focus, then you see a, like there's been some data about just there being less, um, less women in jazz and post-secondary because it's more like that. So, I mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's because of it being a difficult career or because it's, like we don't have those historical figures. I mean, there's obviously lots of women in jazz historically that are incredible, but we also kind of expect to always see them like singing or at the piano or whatever. So well, and I don't the, know. The singing one is is uh, I've I've worked with with women who are are instrumentalists, and they always laugh when they walk into a room or a club that they haven't played before, and the sound guy go you know just just assumes they're the singer. Yeah. And, that has uh, happened a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's happened to you with me. Yeah, when and I, I like, I'm not a singer. You don't want me and doing I, that. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I'm just, I'm, this is just barely coming back to me. We, we, were, we showed up at a theater and the sound guy, some, yeah, just assumed you were the singer. And um, I think I picked up your saxophones, your, your sax and your, your bass clarinet. I think you had your Barry and your bass clarinet. I think I picked them up and I went and sat in your chair and like started like putting your music in order or something because it was it was um it was good yeah we have to slot into our proper roles apparently yeah that's right (laughs) yeah i mean ideally like i hope we're moving towards a place where it's not an issue because it shouldn't be it makes no actual difference to anything but like it always has been kind of weird so yeah i We'll just keep doing what we do. You know, I, I yeah. remember talking with Jerry Bear going back about 20 years. And, you know, somebody said something about somebody, about somebody's band or something. And it, and it, it was something I was involved in. And, um, and, uh, and someone said something negative about Jerry. And I said, Jerry, they don't even know you. And that's not even an accurate you know, the, the things we go through as performers, because you're always in front of people. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, that's a lot, I'm trying to remember this too, but it was, it was basically, they said something and he said, that's okay. I'm just gonna, I can't, I can't control that. I'm just going to keep doing what I do. Like I have a path that I'm on and things I'm trying to learn and that's all I can do. And, you know, I'm not saying I do it all right. And I went, man, that's, that was a, that was a great life lesson that I got from Jerry mm-hmm. Bear. Don't tell him. Um, but that was like I'm recording this. Yeah, <laughs> it's not yeah, a secret. <laughs> he never listens to anything I say anyway. He'll he'll hear everything you say if he listens to it, and he'll never listen to a word I say. Um, no, for for real though. Like I remember, I, I think I was like 21, so he was like 30, 
50, 60, like 62 probably. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for that one. But um, but yeah, I remember that. I remember that stuck. But we'll keep doing what we do. So, so in relation to what we do, uh, what was your favorite or what was... What was the best Calgary Jazz Orchestra concert we've ever done? Interpret gets, the word best however yeah. you want. Oh, okay. Oh, this gets this gets tricky because I keep being like, oh, so in the last what? Like four or five years? And then I'm like, the no, what is it like 10 years? years yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh now I'm 60, 50, <laughs> thousand. Um <laughs> uh, 60, 50, 100, two years 60, old. 60, 50, 100. Um you don't look a day I, over 50, 50, 100, by the way. Oh, thank you. i got to get another a new filter on those or something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm cuter with like the dog ears. Um, I always love every time we've been able to play Duke Ellington because that's just my favorite big band stuff that exists. Um, so no, I mean, as far as like other arrangements that we've played. I have um, a question about that specifically. Mm-hmm. When we do Duke Ellington, of course, we ar- I, like, I'll arrange a bunch of stuff, but we'll also use stuff right from Ellington's book. Mm-hmm. Is it your favorite because there's no bass bone, so y- you're not fighting with mm-hmm. Greg for your... I never thought of that. No, I, that can't be because my <laughs> other favorite things are when I get to play like a really awesome part with Greg. He is amazing to sit in front of and just like... Just sounds awesome and it's so much fun no i love bass trombone so i would never have something be my favorite because there's none of it Uh, um yeah so i mean that's just because duke ellington is just one of my my very favorite um musicians in his band and i mean also his his writing like he's writing he's he's like best buds with harry carney and he wrote just wonderful parts for him so it's really unique very parts um and then also i just like i love all the stuff that we've done that we've just like reimagined i always have a very large spot in my heart for the christmas show too because i love christmas (laughs) um and it's always like i don't know that's always been kind of a special thing too is to get to now as an adult kind of re and i guess i'm maybe reflecting on stuff like this more just because now i have a little baby but to get to play things that i knew from when i was little and then you have that whole lifetime of being familiar with a piece of music and then as an as an adult you're seeing how um someone has put that together and reinterpreted it for for a big band so something you're really familiar with and just approaching it like years later for something else kind of why it was really fun to play all like the disney songs and stuff too so I don't know. It's hard to pick favorites because we've also played, I think, ages ago. We, I think we should do a Mingus show again because that's another thing that I think it's that been a long a lot. time since we've done a Mingus show. It has. I think we're due. <laughs> and it's always, it, you know, doing the music of Charlie Mingus, you know, for everyone listening, it, it, it just just listen to Ah Um or Roots and Blues or, you know, those records. Oh, yeah. They It is so infectious. And it, I mean... It's a different thing for us when we go through music school and we and we are exposed to these things and we're exploring these things, which of course the regular person isn't doing. It's it's our job to bring to bring that music to them, and every mm-hmm. time you know we play Charles Mingus or I ask someone and they, they didn't know I like when we did Mingus I can't remember we did another our second half was a, was a different artist that was more well known that that you know was more accessible or marketable or something but but when mm-hmm. we when they came and they heard Mingus they went that was that was amazing. Oh yeah. You know, when they hear that moaning and uh, better get it in your soul. And, oh my God. and uh, yeah, I remember it just freaked out the first time I heard that. <laughs> like, yeah, it's just, right? it's, you're like, how is this so good? How is this allowed? <laughs> Especially as a Barry Sax player, moaning is yeah. pretty great. Okay, cool. Um, what was, what was the best Calgary Jazz Orchestra moment that you can remember? Best Calgary Jazz Orchestra moment that I can remember. Oh, that's hard. I'm so, I can never even, it's going to no, favorite color I can pick, but favorite anything is so difficult. Okay. Well, what? Because there's just like so much within that. What's your favorite Star Wars movie? Okay. Well, okay some, some favorites, I guess I can pick. I can, Empire. It's my favorite. Empire. Star Wars movie. Okay. Yeah. I really like Rogue One. Yeah. Rogue One was fun. Right. It was very neat. And you are, so you're, you're a bit of a Star Wars. Um, you like it. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. I don't mind it. I mean, how my many... baby's name is Luke. I have a stormtrooper behind me. I don't really <laughs> want anybody. Well, 
how many how many i i remember this because i remember the pictures but when you when you went to uh disneyland and they had the huge star wars shop opened uh how many action figures did you purchase actually i didn't because you stole i them? i stole all of them no. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's recorded i didn't actually know i don't know we were already on like a grand adventure trip and i was like we just had a giant because we went on our as my cousin was eight at the time, he said we were going on a honey party. So we went for our honeymoon or honey party. And um, that was a very fun adventure. But it was like, we just had a wedding. I don't have any money. We have to be grown ups now. And now I'm like, I wish I bought more toys at Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a little Jedi Mickey Mouse that Luke plays with a lot. So oh, again, cool. good thing I bought myself toys so that I could share some of them with him later. That's awesome. Um, um, maybe favorite, favorite moment. Uh, and I know I'm just going to like Christmas again. I don't look for jazz things, but like there, there have just been times in the, the Oh Holy Night one when we play it that I've just like, I don't know, Christmas is my very favorite thing. And there's just so much of the year is just ridiculous. And the fact that we do that each year and it just builds and it's this just gorgeous arrangement that Paul Ashwell did that I just, I don't know, I, I get chills um, from that arrangement a lot. And I think the fact that we do it almost every year is makes it really really special so it's kind of a repeated moment but it's powerful for really me every like time it. yeah and, and actually honestly to sing it is uh is a lot of um it's a hard thing to explain how it drains you because it's it it's it's technically a, a difficult thing to sing as a singer but but at the end i'm um i don't know you when you when you go to that place it's amazing but you you can't you can't keep doing it like <laughs> there's yeah. the tank trade so quick because it, it, there's so much in, in it. And everything so I got to do it at the end. <laughs> yeah. And everything you mentioned is, is, is accurate. Like the year is, is wound up in it. Your, your feelings about emotion and family and Christmas and loved ones and loved ones we've lost and family and friends and all of us being together on stage in front of a room of, of beautiful people. It, it's, um, yeah, it's, I, I hear you. I miss everybody. <laughs> Me too. Do you remember? Do you remember when we were playing? And because I remember this, because you asked me about this after, and I said, uh, you know, are there any kids? I think it was a matinee concert um, in the Christmas series, and um, and it was uh, it was a it was a full room, and I I asked people what their favorite Christmas song was, and someone said something, and so we we played it like just you know Im impromptu improv kind of. And then someone else and we played it and I had everyone in the room sing along. And then I said, you know, what kids are here and what uh, and and, you know, what, you know, what, what are your favorite songs? And the, uh, the you know, there were a bunch of kids there, of course, and and one jumped up on their chair. And I think they said Santa Claus is coming to town. And he he was jumping and I said, what's your favorite? And he said, Santa Claus is coming to town. And I don't know, I don't know what, okay. And then I said, well, would you, um, would you like to come sing it with me? And he goes, yeah. And he jumps down off his chair and comes running down the hall, the concert hall and runs up the, the to the stage. Do you remember this? Because after you said, you. was this, a, was he a plant? Yes. And, and I'm like, no, he wasn't a plant. And oh. you guys know, I'll do some goofy things or fun things. Yeah. I planted choirs in the audience and. If, if I think it'll be musical and I would have done that had I been smart enough to think of it, but no, it was just literally words that came out of my mouth. I had no idea I was going to say it. And then he came running up and, uh, and then, I, and then he sang with, with us and I sang back and forth with him and, and he grabbed the, the guest vocalist mic of the, I think Johanna was on that show. I recall grabbed her mic and, and yeah. sang, and then she, and then he went back to his seat. And after the parents came up to me and said, um, you know, he, he doesn't talk and he's extremely, he doesn't talk very much and he's extremely shy. And he oh, came up and answered all my questions and smiled and sang the whole song and went oh. back to his parents with his huge, his huge boots and his huge jacket. And he was <laughs> like maybe six, five. I was just like, yeah, do you remember that now? I, I remember, I think I remember like a kid coming up and, and singing, but I don't recall hearing about that that second part about him not normally talking because i feel like i would just waterworks like yeah, that's amazing I, I hope wherever that kid is now i mean i hope he's like still coming to these shows because that would be awesome but i hope he has like not lost that 
like that ability to come up. Cause I mean, as an adult, like you'll, you'd say, do you want to come up and sing? And they'd be like, Oh no. And no like, adult would do it. Yeah. 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 So that's amazing. Like what a little champion. Yeah. Yeah. You gave me the that's waterworks so for that one. I was so blown away by, I was so blown away. I was also blown away cause I wouldn't have been able to do that when I was a kid. No, so, no. Actually right. another like favorite after show moment was in, um, it was either Lethbridge or Olds. I think it's Olds. Um, one of the, um, yeah, it was Olds where we do that um, performance every the year around like November. And the, yeah. And the workshops and everything. Yeah. There was one year that this gentleman came up to me after the show and I, I cannot remember his name. On the off chance he's watching this, I'm really, really sorry. Um, but he came up and we talked a bit about saxophone. He's like, yeah, I always wish I played saxophone, but I didn't. And I was like, why don't, why don't, why don't you go play saxophone? Like there's it's no rule and he was like there are saxophones out like, there i've seen them. It's like i'm an adult i should have started when i was a kid and i was like whatever it doesn't matter and then he's like oh and then we came back the next year and he came up and he was like i went and rented a saxophone it's really fun i'm really enjoying it and i was just like ah play saxophone that's awesome that's amazing. so yeah stuff like that just makes me really really happy oh me too oh that's amazing i hadn't heard that story oh <gasps> yay story time okay what uh now you have a little boy, Luke, and he turns Thank one you. in six days. Is that correct? It looks he like does. You are on the ball. Or at least I think. I'm trusting you. I know it's next week. So. It's six days. <laughs> it is. Uh, it's, um, next. it's Friday today. I'm not good at math, so I brought my calculator out and made sure that I was right. And, and you typed in Luke's birthday. Luke's birthday. <laughs> yeah. Six days. It's a good calculator. <laughs> um, it's a smart calculator. The uh, That's pretty awesome. And he's going to be at the... Uh, I'm sure he'll be at the CJO shows and uh, like he's going to be a CJO kid for the next, you know, 15 years. He's already been a CJO kid, but nobody knew about him. Yeah, so last was... year, <laughs> yeah, okay. The last concert that we did was last February. And I remember we played um, two of the songs we played in the soul part were, we, I think we did James Brown's Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. And we did With that crazy saxophone uh, part. Yeah, which he noticed. <laughs> and, <Was> he? <laughs> yes. So after that whole like saxophone, whatever, I don't know what his thoughts were. I don't know if he loved it or hated it, but he had some thoughts. And so like after we all like sat down, he was like, what is happening? <laughs> so that was extremely cool was that that was around the time where I was starting to feel and was January, February. And we played um, a couple of shows during that and I could I could feel him kicking there and I was like hey, I'm gonna remember this forever this is extremely cool and then I hadn't really made any sort of social media announcement or whatever and I was like oh this will be so fun by April I'll get to have like I'll have like a suit and a tie and I'll play saxophone with a big baby in my tummy and then everything shut down and I just stayed home I, I he was, got to uh, come to some concerts in my tummy I was very curious to see because um my my former assistant uh, who's a great saxophone player as you, and you know her very well Lacey yeah Lacey Marchand she um she would talk about playing alto saxophone when she was pregnant and how how there was no air and she said there's just yeah. no air to the point that she put it down and I was like how is Sarah gonna play Barry and I know you would have found a way but I was like how yeah. is like when we hit when we hit our June concert of course which was canceled to COVID but I was uh very intrigued to see how that would uh, how how you were going to pull that off um, oh me too because you have no air like yeah, it's, yeah they showed us a diagram and the baby's just there and they're like oh and all your organs go up here and you're like Whoa. like i think your lungs your lungs are like, oh. doing this and yeah <laughs> yeah you walk up some stairs and you're like i have to lie down so i, I mean yeah i would have uh, figured it out but it would have been wrong <laughs> I, I mean i voice, did play a little bit at home but i have a voice student who just uh had um she uh, took a break at the beginning of May because she just had a baby a couple weeks ago. And even like just, yeah, just leading up. And I said, no, just you just have to imagine this is what your body's doing because I can't yeah. relate. But from what I've seen in the, you know, I went in and looked at the the the, the x-rays and stuff of, mm -hmm. of pregnant women. I'm like, yeah, you this is going to be difficult. And she's like, oh, I yeah. just, I'm out of breath when she's singing. I'm like, well, I, I can't. <laughs> Yeah, you I just have to fully take relate, some but I, yeah, just do your best. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> oh man. Okay, so what is your favorite fascination outside of music? My favorite fascination outside of music. Um, I mean, I do a lot of do a lot of just sort of artsy hobbies and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I don't. Know, I love movies. Everybody loves movies, but I am like 
I do study and teach film as well. So I already kind of talked about that. Um, I, oh, I guess this is kind of an, an interesting one. I don't know. Again, I don't know what my like very biggest fascination or hobby or whatever. Um, I do knit a lot, but I also make very tiny little clay things, which I don't know if people have seen. Do you really? Um, do you have one yeah. there? Can you show us? I should have brought them. They are in my basement. But I make, I started just making these for, I made tiny little clay, um, like food and stuff for dolls when I was little. And a while ago, I just started doing it for no apparent reason. And my husband um, plays Dungeons and Dragons. I was like, oh, can you make me some props? And I just started making all this elaborate, like tiny clay stuff. So I, I don't know. I've always really just loved making things. If it's, okay. if it's music, if it's crafts, like. Now I, I want a clay something. Ecto-1. I want you to make me a little clay Ecto-1. That's a lot more complicated than like a tiny piece of cake or a oh, little tear. Oh, okay. But I mean, I'm not write it down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, this uh, this is my favorite uh, tea mug, and um, you know the, the the drummer. We haven't had him with the CJO yet, but he's he's a great drummer. Um, uh, Robin Harris. He made this. He does uh, pottery, and he it, it's actually my favorite. I think that's his. Um, little brand that he puts in everything. Oh, I love it. That's awesome. I said I liked gray and I liked white um, because it's calming to me, which is why my office and the studio and everything has that theme to it. But I find it really calming. And then when I want it to be Christmas, I just put red everywhere. When I want it yeah. to be, you know, I can, you know, but, uh, but he made this for me. And uh, uh, yeah, so um, maybe you could make me a really little one. Okay, that I, that I could absolutely do. Okay. <laughs> like a tiny one. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I think making stuff like that, especially things with your hands, it's just such an intriguing thing to be able to do. I don't know if you've seen, like, Michael Callender does blacksmithing. Blacksmithing, yeah. So cool. Yeah. And he do also does um, Michael Callender from the, the trombonist from the Calgary Jazz. Mm. And he, um, just for those listening. Um, <laughs> and uh, he also is, uh, him and his dad uh, and his grandfather. And possibly his great grandfather all were model uh, model A uh, car enthusiasts. So he's picked up that hobby from his his um, dads and dads yeah. and dads above him. And, I'm not uh, convinced he's not a time traveler. He has very cool like old timey hobbies. <laughs> if maybe he's Doctor Who and the real <gasps> he's the real Doctor Who. He's the doctor. Mm. He comes and he's like, oh, I have all this old timey car and blacksmithing. Yeah. Like, um, and trombone. Yeah. Okay. So cool. And you also like video games. I know that. I do. Which yes. favorite? So now video I'm just game thinking all about all time. of these. Um, probably the original Knights of the Old Republic. I love a lot. <laughs> Did you play <laughs> the new one, the um, Jedi Fallen Order? I have not had. A whole lot of time to play any games in quite a while and it makes me really sad because there's a lot that I keep seeing being like oh it looks really fun when I have time and like I don't know that whole thing when you say when I have time and then you just wait to have time and you don't so I mean I'll have to make time eventually right now it's all kind of getting gobbled by by this little baby but by little Luke yeah. well husband Luke Sarah yes. video games <laughs> that's true and i mean hopefully once i'm not just like working from home and taking care of them and whatever i'll be yeah. able to do more things but now things i think are are opening up and we'll get to be sort of a real person again maybe you you've never stopped being a real person um yeah. <laughs> the uh we can just act we can just we can act like it again um yeah. okay um okay yeah, we're gonna I'm get into to the rapid what fire kinda... oh, rapid yeah. Rapid fire questions. Rapid fire. Um, okay. Before we do that, do you have anything to ask me? You don't have to. I'm sure I probably do. And I'm sure as soon as we get off of this, I'll be like, oh, I should be texting me. <laughs> be like, okay, we'll hop back on. I'm sure people are still watching. <laughs> They're waiting for, for like the encore performance. Um, what's, what, I, oh. I was gonna say like, what are you most looking forward to getting back into shows? But I mean, that's, it's probably everything. It's just um, everything. And I, I was gonna also say like, what particular artist or show are you most excited about potentially like doing with the CGO? But I don't know if that's spoilers. So I don't know if you're allowed to talk about anything you might want to do in the, the next season back or if that's next season. top secret. Well, we, I really wanted to do Sweet Jubilation again. 
because mm-hmm. we were going to do it for our 15 year celebration. So we might do that next yeah. April. Um, okay. I am talking with three artists. So until they're confirmed, I can't announce um, to, uh, for coming in. I've, uh, I'm really looking, you know what? It was, I really missed doing our Art of Soul concert in February and yeah. with strings. And I missed that. And I have a lot of ideas for that. So, but I think it's just all of it. I, I don't even think I know. That's oh, truth. I know. That's why I was like, this isn't, I mean, it's, it's everything. I mean, I'm and sure the, everyone just misses rehearsals the board. and having a snack in the middle and like, yeah. <laughs> hanging out in the base. Like, I don't know, even all the, like all of the music things for sure. And then even just seeing everybody the and community and the hang and, yeah. the, and the growth together, right? Like just, we, we all mm-hmm. got better as musicians together. Um, yeah. We're better together. There's no way around that. Um, oh. I know there's a, I won't say who it was because uh, I, I don't know if um, if this person would, would like me to say, but there's a person in our group that would probably surprise you that came to me and said, I was going to quit playing. I was going to wow. quit being a professional player, like maybe pull it out from time to time, but it was, it's, it's difficult, it's time consuming, um, and they weren't feeling uh, that they were connecting, and they said uh, the CJO was what kept me practicing every day. That's and wonderful. Then, and then they launched into a whole different side of their music career outside of CJO, but as well. And and I, you know, yeah, that That's made me wonderful. that made me weepy. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, rapid fire questions that are not <laughs> weepy. Okay, you ready for this? Yes. <laughs> Good, because you're being graded heavily. Oh no! If life were a video game, what would the best cheat code be? I mean, that Sims one was a mother load or rosebud and you just you get all the money. And I'm not saying money buys happiness, but it means you don't have to do all the things that don't make you happy. So <laughs> then you can like, you can play all the music you want. You have time to do all the art that you want. You can have a whole room for every single one of your hobbies. You can fly your friends to Disney World and then you can play shows there. So, I mean, uh, infinite money sounds so like infinite greedy, money. but... Okay. See, I, I think... Pick I'm, the I'm wrong very, career, right? I'm so disappointed because... Uh, of all the billionaires out there, and Jeff Bezos, and all these bill, and none of them have decided to become Batman yet, and that yeah. that really freaks me out because that would be my first choice. So, uh, what is the worst? The worst buy one get one free sale that you could imagine. I mean, no, that's terrible. <laughs> okay, you text me that one later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first thing that came to my head, and it would have been amazing had we had them, but with just how exhausted I have been with having one little baby, I feel like twins is a bit of a buy one, get one free. <laughs> 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 I, I've just done some like online forums when I've been like, this is so hard having a baby. And then people are like, I have two babies. Twins. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, I know nothing about hardship. <laughs> but I also think that would be kind of awesome and it would eventually be amazing. But right now I'm still in the thick of it and I want to sleep. <laughs> so, um, but I don't know what the actual worst buy one, get one. Maybe some kind of no, like, I, I like that. exotic I like pet that. that they eat each other or something. <laughs> I like that. There was a, there was a couple we sat beside at the Blue Note just before the shutdown in New York. And they said uh, for a show, and we were just chatting beforehand. And they said, oh, we have um, five kids. And I said, five, that's a lot. Like, wow, good for you. And and um, we were talking about it and stuff. And it's something like, and they're like, well, it wasn't planned. And, uh, but we had twins and we had, I think it was two, two girls. And they said, well, let's, let's try for a boy. So we have the twins and they said that was, they only wanted two kids. They had twins and they were like, wow, that was an incredible amount of work. And the twins got to be two and a half or something. And they're like, let's try for a boy. And then they, they got pregnant again and they went in to see if it was a boy or girl. And the, and the, the doctor said, yes, it's a boy and two girls. And they were having triplets. (laughs) Oh man. 
Oh you reminded me of that goodness. story, and I just my jaw hit the floor, and I said, "You, you are you people have some serious um, constitution. You're just yes. some strong individuals there. My goodness." Yeah, and I mean, obviously, not to say that twins would be bad; that would be amazing. But I think when you're planning for one and you get two, it's a lot. <laughs> Whereas if you're like, "Oh, a free sweater or something." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. What two things become really weird and awkward? when you do them back to back right after each other? No, this is really hard. I'm not going to get a good grade at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what have people said? <laughs> what do other people say? That's what I say I mean, when the census person comes around. They're like, sir, how many people live in this house? And I'm like, I don't know. Is a, I'm under a tremendous amount of pressure. To be what fair, other people say when we did our census, I was like, two people live here, and then I had to be like, oh no, another person does live here now. So this year it was kind of different <laughs> to adjust to. Um, oh no, I don't know. I'm... Okay, we'll skip that one. What is the creepiest thing that you could say to one of us before we walk on stage? Um, what is the creepiest thing that I can say? Because some pretty crazy stuff happens backstage. Mm -hmm. Nothing. You can't remember anything or think of anything. Like things that have happened backstage? What, like, you sound... It sounds like I should be aware of, like, is it haunted and I don't know about it? <laughs> it's probably haunted, but it probably uh, is haunted. It's a uh, ghost of concerts past. Okay. Okay. How about something else then? If we could eliminate war, all war, what would you, how would you have countries settle their differences? Pogs. Why, oh, why pogs. pogs. What are pogs? Um, that's why I'm very confused as to why I just thought of that. I was like, what's a game that's really peaceful? <laughs> um, <laughs> did you not play Pog? <laughs> it's a thing in the and 90s little, and you had those... the circles and you had to flip them over. And then I never wanted to play anyone because I made my own Pogs out of a cereal box with my school picture on it. And nobody wanted to win that one. So I, I'm, um, just, I'm just seriously like I'm, I, I'm in my head. I'm picturing uh, Joe Biden and um what's the russian president um putin, putin and vladimir putin and kim jong-un playing pog just yeah. sitting down they've got their slammers and like yeah that's right yeah. <laughs> you know what pogs are i remember I have zero explanation for why i suddenly just thought of those for the first time in what like 20 something years okay. um but i guess that's how we should be settling our differences pogs in in three words three words only so choose them carefully. What would the world be like if every single person was like you? Uh, nobody would be able to answer questions very well. Uh, that's, they wouldn't that's more get than instructions, three right? Because three it would words. be more than three words. <laughs> I, ha I have a baby, you guys. <laughs> it's done things to my brain. Um, three words. sleepy but excited all right i like it you get a point okay if we were playing on stage we're playing on stage so visualization right it's very important so we're visualizing we're on stage the cowboy jazz orchestra we've got a full room let's say it's the christmas show it's your favorite show and we're doing perfectly frank christmas and we see police officers coming at the back and you see them and they start walking up the aisles they walk right up on stage they arrest you and they take you away. What would all of us assume that you were arrested for? Oh. What am I most likely to get super arrested for? <laughs> like not just regular arrested, like super, super arrested. arrested. Okay, yeah. I mean, uh... 
I feel like you probably wanted to have me arrested that time I accidentally carried my folder upside down and it was really windy and all my music fell out and blew away. I think you should get arrested for that. So I'm still living with the guilt. I still feel bad about it. That makes that me feel like better. I'm arrested awful. by guilt. You know who else did it actually who did that was uh, J. Michael acted that. Our no. Player. Maybe and that's why he was able to find some of my blown away ones so well. It's maybe. I think he came back close to my close to my house where we rehearse in the, in the studio here. And be, do you know, I was out for a run in the spring and I was, <laughs> I was running out along and in the uh, culvert, like in the, where the snow was melting and the water was running mm -hmm. were all these arrangements I'd written, you know, <laughs> they were all, I ran all these out, it was baritone like sax black. and trumpet one oh. parts were all, I was finding them all. I said like I heard because it was really, really windy for, I mean, we're up in like, the north part of Calgary is bonkers windy and it was, it was pitch black in February and the wind was just kind of like whistling through the trees and I was like, listen to those leaves blowing in the wind. Oh no. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then I was like, what is pieces of paper? And I was running down the street in the dark. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. So I was trying not, not to relive that memory and for some reason, of course, that's what my brain just kept pushing to the let's, front. Let's, so. let's not repeat it. What doesn't no. actually exist but you wish you owned. Wish that I owned doesn't exist. A weightless baritone saxophone. <laughs> okay, very good. I thought you were going like to say Like a little pocket one. I um, have three lightsabers. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, so they do about. exist. Okay, okay. <laughs> What's your okay? What is, one of what is, them? One of them is like the little toy plastic one, what, and Luke plays with it. I gave you one. I think so. Yeah, I remember that. And then what? What? Uh, what is? What is the best color of lightsaber? Um, I like blue. If it was for me, if a lightsaber. Okay. I mean, if I could have this combination of like crystals, where it was like a teal leaning blue, I would like that. <laughs> Tealy blue. <laughs> that could be okay. Um, okay. That should be a song. Tealy blue. Tealy blue. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Yeah. Um, Teely Blue by Steely Dan. You're listening <laughs> to Night Sounds with Sarah. Um, so, okay, tell me a product that we could make for people coming to our concerts. Okay, so we have a very comfy sweatshirt that I have. I have a hat that's really cool. Um, I mean... Bears. Teddy bears. Okay. Okay, teddy um, bears. I think that's I mean, a good I still idea. I have okay. lightsabers on the brain too. So, I mean, well, you, always... you, when don't you have lightsabers on the brain? So um, now never. what would be the absolute worst name for that bear? That CJO bear. Green bear. Green. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for the CJO bear. I was thinking the blue nail bear because calling him green would be weird. The worst name for the CJO bear would be um I don't know, flat note out of tune bear. Oh my god. Okay. Like my conversations are with a tiny baby and we just sing Sesame Street songs all day. Uh we should do a Sesame Street show. What's your favorite Sesame Street song? Um right now. Okay, well, I really like put down the ducky if you want to play the saxophone because I think that's the ducky. What? How does that go? There's, um, it's Sing the one where Ernie bars. wants to play saxophone, but he's got a, a rubber duck in his hand, and that makes it difficult. They go, we gotta put down the ducky, put down the ducky, put down the ducky if you want to play the saxophone. <laughs> and another one I'm a big fan of, and I want to see if you can. Do you remember the one where they count to? to 12 it was one over just this like animated bit that ran one, like two, three, four, five, four, six, five, seven, six, seven, eight, eight, nine, nine, ten, ten eleven twelve. twelve. yeah 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 <laughs> that is luke's favorite thing he will be crying and apparently you sing that. that was a that was a, a a really incredibly staffed like funk party band from toronto that recorded that back in the 70s i and looked it up and it said it was a pre-fame pointer sisters really yeah, I don't know about that. I I know I I, I, I don't know. That was, was Wikipedia, actually, so it was actually recorded in. I mean, it might be right because the story I heard could be wrong, but that it was recorded by like, and I think Doug Riley was somehow involved with it. Um, but I can't I can't recall. 
Okay. It could be could be both. <laughs> it could be the party band and maybe they were with it. But could yeah, so that's um, obviously a very awesome song. What what is a we're gonna rename the baritone saxophone. What are we gonna rename it to? What would what would be some of the weirdest because saxophone already sounds really weird when you think of it. Um mm-hmm. so and baritone's generic. So what if we renamed it, what would be a very accurate strange name that we awkward name we could give it yeah you're right baritone's generic and just kind of refers to the range of the instruments saxophone is from like the inventor's last name was sax, sax so it'd be like yes. if i called it like a, a matheson phone <laughs> just ridiculous well, um, it would be a matheson nado phone yeah and that's yeah. a mouthful it's a lot um yeah because it's just really large and and low i mean a, some kind of foghorn like a Barky, Sh- a shiny gold honky fog worm. <laughs> Barky, shiny gold honky Barky. funk. It's a, a honky, honky funk. funk. There we go. Like it's a honky funk. Got it. Uh, what movie completely? Because you like movies, completely changes its plot when one letter in the title is changed. And what is new about that? What is that movie about now? Ooh. I think all of like any movies. Wait. Um, I mean, am I like substituting in a different word or just taking a word out? Just one letter. One letter. Oh, one letter. Like, oh, okay. Um, if we took out uh, Star Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> what would Star that be? Star Wars. There's just one. There's just one. <laughs> there was only one war in stars. Then it might be Stars like, War. The Star Wars ones. I was just thinking of because you said Rogue One earlier. Rogue on. <laughs> so Rogue on, man. Rogue on. Yes. That okay. sounds like a like a beatnik uh, traveling through, uh, you know, California in the '60s. Yeah, but you could still have it kind of set in space, so they're all just in like a space basement, a basement, and a space map. having their their blue milk, and they the whole Star Wars are happening outside, but they're just in the basement, like listening to their cantina music music and saying rogue on <laughs> again hey uh, this is when you asked her, i was like i should probably maybe i should practice like talking to adults i mean i guess i've been teaching but that's like planned material things and i'm like oh this will be interesting do i know how to talk to someone who's not a tiny baby anymore <laughs> so i apologize that my my brain is still figuring out how to what brain. about what about shaving private ryan and the whole movie is just like about the barbers in the war it's just about about beards, <laughs> about <It's> war just... <laughs> beards. There's just been a lot of movies I feel like in which Matt Damon has been a character that has been like lost in some place, and that the government has had to spend a lot of money getting him back. Like Saving Private Ryan and like The Martian. There's a couple other ones. Born like, Identity. Almost, yeah, like how much money is the government like spent on finding Matt Damon? <laughs> wow, really a lot. that's heavy. Yeah. Um. If the five members of the Calgary Jazz Orchestra saxophone section were represented by food, what would they be? Well, this has nothing to do with sort of like a a personality thing or anything. I just really like the name Jerry Carrot. So (laughs) (laughs) I just feel like it's it's really cute. Jerry Bear would be a carrot. Yeah. And like a Jerry Carrot, if you were. A Jarrett, and you bear it. Maybe that's why. And you bear it. it. And you bear it. That's what you would be. We're just little Jerry carrots. Jerry, like he doesn't even have red hair. I don't know where this is coming from. So now I'm thinking of everybody being like vegetables or some kind of produce or something. Okay. Um, okay, So we got Jerry carrots. Jeremy has really really cool hair, and it kind of sticks up a bit. And it doesn't. It not doesn't stick up like a pineapple. But now that I've thought of a pineapple, like. He's a pineapple. Like um, the only person whose hair is almost as cool as a pineapple's foliage is probably okay. Jeremy. <laughs> okay. And what about Richard and Richard Hardy? Oh, Richard is just like so full of joy and happiness. Maybe a strawberry. I don't really have any particular reason for it. I just really like Shane strawberries. Stats? I really like Rich. Oh, I really like this chain too. Now everybody has to be strawberries. Chain stats. Chain stats. I mean, he's pretty cool and relaxed. He's easy going. Yeah. You like a watermelon? All right. He could really be like Walter watermelon. Melon on the saxophone. Ooh. Yes. 
Yes. The, like secret fruit identities. I started with vegetables and then I ended up with fruits. It's just all, what would you be? It's produce. Um, I mean, last year I was sort of an avocado, same thing, tummy, <laughs> but um, <laughs> Luke's a little avocado pit, I guess. Yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> okay, that works. Okay, <laughs> last question. What movie would be the worst decision to make into a musical? I was thinking at first, I was like, okay, what about like something really, really violent? And then everyone's singing during it. And I was trying to think of a horror movie that is mostly focused on just like the gore. And then I was thinking of Saw, but like that almost might be amazing. <laughs> like, Saw the like it was a terrifying horror movie. Maybe it would cheer everybody up. Maybe everyone's like locked up and it's really violent and scary, but then there's like a cheeky tap number. Like maybe it would be good. <laughs> Saw the musical. That's you're yeah. you're going with that. Or Alien. How about Alien the musical? Actually, I think that would be great because it could come out and have like jazz hands and then they could all dance. You could have like really good music accompanying it, like bursting out. There'd be like the melodic contour, like what would be a whole thing. What are, I don't know. All of these sound like great ideas. What are the lines? What are the? I don't know any lines from Saw, but I know uh, what was the, the one of the famous. They mostly come at night. Mostly that would be a song. They mostly, they yeah. mostly come at night mostly. mostly you know like they mostly come at night mostly they would be a whole so what i'm hearing from this is that for an october show you <laughs> should have like musical theater style songs inspired by horror movies <laughs> for halloween <laughs> wow um genius idea genius idea um is there anything else uh that that you'd like to mention or say to anyone or, or mention to the CJO fans or anything before we sign off? Uh, I wish I had better answers for rapid fire questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is obviously will haunt my, my nightmares for the rest of my life. Um, but I am just really, really happy to, I mean, especially with kind of news today of things, I mean, I don't know if things are going to go back to normal, normal, but things getting slightly closer to us being able to see everybody again. Um, I hope everybody is staying just, I don't know, safe and healthy and listening to lots of good music at home. At least we have like the technology to be able to watch concerts online and, and do stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think this is such a cool idea. I hope people are enjoying watching these things and knowing how how dorky i was gonna say we all are but everyone else that i've watched pretty parts much of you has been and cool. me are the dorks it's, yeah. yeah i was like everyone else has been totally chill and probably has great ideas when i'm just like nah. um <laughs> okay, but yeah and, i'm and so, really so excited we would tell them and you would tell them to recordings to listen to dexter gordon's go john coltrane's a love supreme mm. um and the other one you mentioned there the name of the band that prog rock group you like uh, that one's Mastodon. So Mastodon. their earlier stuff is kind of heavier metal, but it turns more prog rockish later around the Crack the Sky album. But I, I think it's phenomenal. I really like that album. Okay. So. And what else? Depends uh, what you're into. <laughs> what else? Uh, what other what other jazz, jazz records would you tell people to listen? Tell our listeners to to check out. What are the um, ones that like really just touched you, warmed you, made you want to play? I want to play. I really loved. Um, Miles Davis's Birth of the Cool because that was one of the first actual jazz records that I listened to because I was learning to play Barry and or my teacher Mulligan was like you should listen to Jerry Mulligan and yeah. that's the one they had at the library when I went to the library to get a CD and so I it's beautiful arrangements and just wonderful playing so that would be a really fun one to um to play like a I don't know, big band version of or something but yeah there we I've tried because it's a the tent non-it tentet non-it yeah. it's nine or ten and uh i, have I, to li I haven't listened to it in ages, i've wanted actually. to do it it's just it's just uh it kind of uh, takes away from it if you suddenly have more people maybe but i don't know i it's it's arranged so perfectly i yeah speaking as an arranger i wouldn't want to touch it that's the hard thing because you're like well i want to play it but it's yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. i don't want to change like, stuff it's kind of perfect like it's yeah it's, it's really perfect birth of the cool okay cool yeah um Thank you so much, Sarah, for coming tonight. Uh, thank and, you uh, for having me and for setting this up and, and having everyone on. You bet. And we'll see you uh, We'll see you soon. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And uh, you stay safe and we'll see you soon. Yay.